Welcome to The Great and Famous. I'm your host, Jim Thompson. Uh, thank you for dropping by. This is going to be a fun episode. Uh, you're in for a treat because in a moment, we're going to meet one of the smartest, most creative, downright likable founders in technology today. I had the good fortune to meet this woman a few years back when we use her technology to launch a new social channel for Gary Vaynerchuk's personal brand. Now, as for the many credits of Kate Bradley Turnus, AKA Kately, uh, they include being co-founder of the remarkable AI-based technology lately, but she's much more than that. She was a music director and an on-air host at Sirius XM, a radio producer, marketing expert, strategist, scholar, but most of all, what I find is she's a master communicator. So in this conversation, we're gonna find out where those superpowers came from and who is the most influential person in her life. So with that, as Kate would say, let her rip. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Boy, I have to tell you that you've done it the best. I've heard a lot of intros of myself, of course, and I really appreciate the style, how you delivered that, um, which is saying something, because even I just read the script, right, the bio. I appreciate that you put it in your own words, and the space that you left is so powerful, Jim. Like, I don't know if you know, but you're good at this. <laughs> I, I, I take that I greatly appreciate that from you, knowing your your background. But th the thing I'll say is it's easy when you do it for a friend because it's natural. It's, it's I just think, I think the world of you. And so it, that's easy to come through. Um, wow. But I'm very excited to have you. <laughs> Boy, I, um, please come to my funeral and give the speech, okay? <laughs> that was like so great. You're hired. <laughs> um, it's. It, you know, I, I like that we are friends. That's the best part, right? And we haven't ever met, but it doesn't matter, you know? And that's the gift that I had before COVID because of radio, you know, I can make friends through the blackness of the nothingness of sound, you know, which is, now that I am here, I understand how difficult that is, but it never was, right? It just came naturally. But, but the idea of, and it's a skill of being able to read a room, any room, the room where you can see people or where you can't see them is difficult, right? Someone was asking me once, like, how do you know if you've got them when you can't see them? And I just entertained myself mm. <laughs> to figure if I'm interesting to me, I must be interesting to someone else. Right. Absolutely. That's, yeah. That's the trick. <laughs> yeah. If you can create something that you have value in more than likely, there's going to be some people out there that will find similar value. Yeah. But, and that's yeah. A, a real hard thing for people to understand which is kind of bonkers to me because people really think that they're boring. I mean, we're both in the, in the industry of helping other people in some way find their zing and communicate it online marketing, right? That's the, the point. And it's so hard for people because they either they're, I don't know if it's shyness or whatever, but maybe it's not understanding the gold within or being able to take something mundane and spin it in a way that that is truly magnetic you know that's our gift i guess but it's it's sad to me sometimes because i'm always rewriting bios for people um, when i'm interviewing them like this you know i see their mm -hmm. bios and i think god that is boring <laughs> or i think none of that says come listen to this person they just haven't communicated their own worth very well you know um and and what a thing to not be good at is to communicate your own worth right right 
that, and that's what I, I always think was fascinating when you and I would have conversations is that you would prompt things I haven't thought about or, or make connections that I, I hadn't made before. And, and just thinking about what it is you do, it just struck me of like why you're unique is because you have a great technology solution, but you've married it with you. You've married it with authentic, real communication to a real human being or built it so that it can facilitate a real connection with a human being, which is most technology is not thinking along those lines, but you are exceptional at that piece. Like, how do I make a connection with a human being that will matter? And, and then how do I build a solution around that? So yeah. it was learned by the way, and I like to steal. So every time I hear someone talk about me or us, there's little nuggets in there that I jot down and I walk away with and I try them myself on someone else, you know? So like my investor pitch or my sales pitch is, or, and even these, these appearances are all um, a collection of one liners <laughs> that I've, you know, amassed or twisted or, or thought about, you know, for this moment. And I was thinking about this the other day, I was talking to another entrepreneur who was really electric person. And he was, he was giving me his best one liners. I heard them all and I, I knew what he was doing right away. Right. And, it, and it's, they're not inauthentic. It's just, you say the same things all the time because people ask you mm -hmm. the same things all the time. Right. And, and they, they, they evolve, you know, but, but you know, what gets the, gets the lean in, you start to learn what makes people emote. And so he's running down his with me and I'm just thinking, good job, good job. And then, um, and then it's my turn. <laughs> and uh, he stopped the car, he was driving. <laughs> he stopped the car, cause I turned, cause I turned it on. And cause I just wanted to, cause, cause like in a nice way, in a friendly competitive way, I was like, okay, you, I got your game. Like, here's mine, you know? You wanna see and it? it? Was, Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he was speechless for a minute. And that, it, that felt great. It was great. You know, it was, uh, it was fun. <laughs> well, that it's a gift, right? And that's why there's some people you talk to that you just, you come away from it feeling better than when you started and it's entertaining as hell. So like any conversation with you, I find is super entertaining, no matter <laughs> what we're talking about. Um, and so that's why, you know, when we, as we dive into this, you know, we start talking about your superpowers, uh, what those are and where they came from and how did you, how did you acquire them? Um, I think, I think people will get a lot out of that. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, one of, one of those things, by the way, I, um, I forget who was asking me about this. We were talking about making listeners into fans or customers into evangelists. Right. And, and what does that really mean? And how do you do it? You know, and so one of the ways that I learned was you don't want to be the brightest light in the room that that needs that's on stage entertaining everyone. What you want is to be the person that makes everyone else feel that way. Mm. Right. Because then they're leaving thinking about you and talking about you. And that's what that's what I want, because the the that's the long tail, that's the longevity the power there is infinitely greater than the sale in the moment, right? It's, and it's multiple sales later on. And there are people you can go back to. That's the other thing we, I've learned is, can I swear in your show? Absolutely. <laughs> so I fuck up all the time, Jim. I mean, it's like what I do. My, my husband jokes sometimes. He says, can you fit both feet in there? <laughs> <laughs> and I need to have the grace, or I need other people to have the grace to let me let me come back to them. And and I've gone back to people that I'm sure I have turned off or insulted and somehow brought them around. Sometimes I don't even know how. But I remember one of the, the best lessons I learned in radio was almost always think about this. Your most favorite songs, you didn't really like them the first time you heard them. Is that true? Yeah, for me it is. 
Like I really think about that. Like, cause the ones that you're instantly in love with, they're it's candy, it's Cracker Jack stuff. They're the, you know, those are the trendy pop songs and they probably will annoy you later. But, but the, the ones that you maybe didn't, they kind of hit you the wrong way. And then you're, then you learn to love them. You know, I have friends like that. And they're, those, those are my favorite friends. <laughs> the friend, like, you're not sure if you, I don't, I'm not sure if I really like this guy, but and then you think, well, and that's something that I do is I'm a slow thinker. Like, so I'll hear something and I won't know what I think about it. And then I'll like process it and I'll think about it and it'll, and it'll pop up in the shower. And I mean, and I'll think about, like, wow, no, that really does make sense. Like it takes a time for me to digest stuff and to decide like, do I like that or do I not like that? Yeah. And then it's locked into you. It, it has you. And that's exactly, yeah. that's the person I aspire to be. <laughs> That's a, that's a great analogy that making, making people feel like they're the brightest light in the room. What, what a gift. Um, Thank you. So, you know, where, you know, as you look back on the things that you are good at and the way you do uh, are a masterful storyteller and communicator, uh, was that a natural gift? Did you always have that? Or did you develop it over time? I, so my mom named me after, uh, she was a first grade teacher and she had a student named Catherine Ellis. And this girl used to wear pajamas to class. This is like in the seventies, okay. <laughs> it wasn't like today where people just wear pajamas all the time. Um, and she always had a joke. She was always making the class laugh. And my mom, named me that name because she wanted me to have a really good sense of humor um and when every every year on my birthday my mom always tells me all the stories of when i was born how i was named um how my father drove the wrong car to the 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 lo the junkie loading van to the to pick me up at the hospital and she wanted the mercedes <laughs> You know um, how she picked out the the crib for me and the the color of the outfit I wore that is a color I told her later in years that I hated, but then was the color at my wedding. There you go. <laughs> right, the story. You know, so I grew up with somebody, and I and I always say to her, sometimes we'll miss it, and I'll call her back, and I'm like, you didn't tell me the stories. I love those stories, you know, because well, they're about me, so of course I love them. Um, but I. The answer to your question it is maybe now I see that it was natural, but then I didn't know that. I, I was a fiction writing major in school, so I love writing a story, but I was actually really bad at it for a long time. And God bless those teachers who <laughs> read my awful writing, but I learned to get better. You know, I, I learned a lot about how to carefully craft something and when to drop in those um those kind of callbacks like a comedian does mm -hmm. you know and um i went to so, so in college i i went to the new york summer writers institute um which is now a pretty well-known institute i only went because my professors um let let me do the work study program in school instead of serving mashed potatoes at the hot cafeteria <laughs> and in the summer, um, I needed a job. And so they paid me to do that. And then I would get free room and board up at the college. And I could go to this course with all these other writers. And here's where I learned that writers are assholes. They're all selfish, <laughs> uh, narcissistic <laughs> dingbats. And in this case, they had a lot of money because people were paying quite a lot to go to this camp for a couple of weeks each year which is what it was like, you know, camp, camp for writer camp, writer camp. Yeah. And I, t the only, there was fiction, nonfiction and poetry. I wanted to do fiction, of course, because that's where my heart was, but there was never any openings. And so I had to do poetry and I hated poetry. I really, really did. I thought it was, I mean, I thought it was Valentine's day all the time, you know, not nauseating. And I met this professor whose name I can't remember, um, but, but she was at Columbia and she took 
poems and then she would take apart different phrases and ask us to use those phrases in our own poem. Whereas other poetry teachers always were like giving you rules like iambic pentameter has to be eight lines, all this kind of stuff. And so her idea was like, take this thing and make it your own. And so I'll give you an example. Um, one phrase was by which I mean. Okay, now think of, I love this because think of all the things that can go before and after that and how in itself, it, it is by default a turning point by which I mean, there has to be a pivot there of something unexpected. There's a change right? in direction, right? There's a, there's a change in direction. Something is unclear, so you're gonna clarify it. Um, and so, so that was what, what I was learned, trying to do as well, but I didn't even know it, you know, is, is take those other ideas and metaphorically, the ones that were, I was writing down all the, you know, the corners of my pages and metaphorically, you know, use them. And I only started to love poetry after I became a radio DJ. And I, I realized that it was because of the sound. I liked the sound of the words, words, you know, everyone says the English language is so ugly. I don't, I don't think that at all. Right. And I love, I love um, I love it when radio is sung in a song that word, the word itself, radio, like all the vowels, it, it rhymes with so much and it sounds so good. Um, and there's, I was listening to um, um, Rivers Cuomo from Weezer do an interview with Terry Gross. And she asked him why he, I can't remember which word it was, why he used this word in the lyric instead of another one. And he said, because it sounds better in the song, right? And I was really lucky in radio to work somewhere where everything was super old school and people would go to meetings for hours to create commercials, creative commercials, you mm -hmm. know, for um, the clients. And in fact, the theater of the mind was like this, the prized thing there. Um, so they would do things like makeup skits and where like just out of the blue, you know, where they would create these characters. And like one time I really thought Jody Peterson, um, the music director was literally a banjo aficionado because she was, she was interviewing Bela Fleck and in live at the moment as we didn't see this, but they're like, Bela's like, I'm gonna teach you how to play her on, on the radio. And so she's picking it up and she times a couple and bam, and he's teacher and she's like amazing. And of course, that's not what happened. It was Bela playing, right? Oh. But they, in this moment, yeah, and it was incredible. And I remember like racing, I was I was about to be on the air. So I was racing to the studio because I wanted to see her play. I was like, Jody, you know, and I got there and, and I was like, oh my God, you're so good. Um, and so, you know, the answer is I, I didn't know that I was good at telling the story. And in fact, I, I don't even think I am because you can you can hear this now i have a very hard time staying in straight line right I, I zigzag all over the place and i have to keep remembering to come back to the center or i have to have people who do that for me you know like lauren who you've met who works for us mm -hmm. she's so good at keeping me coming back to the center um you know because i I, <laughs> I get i get way out there and I can tell people's eyes are just going, where is she? You know, and Lauren will say something to bring us right back. Um, but that's where the magic is off center, <laughs> right? Isn't that where yeah. some of the greatest insights it's connecting, you know, often it's connecting ideas that you think are not related. Yeah. And when someone can see that connection and you don't see it, like, wait, what are you talking about? And they explain like, no, 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 these things are related and, and I'm going to bring it back because I can see the four connections you make that bring you back. Whereas most people can say, oh, I can see the two connections, but I don't see four, but you're like, yeah, you have to go out further and then come back the long way and you get there. <clears throat> so that's, I don't, I don't think that is a, a failing. It is a skill that most people don't have. Thanks. Those are my people too. Like I can tell right away if, if I'm with somebody who can't go there with me, you know, 
and then then I just try to walk away <laughs> as soon as possible because it's not going to be fun for anybody. <laughs> like the Cliff Notes version of this story isn't worth it. <laughs> no, not even that. Um, and it's such it's so funny because I, I meet a lot of those people actually in, because they're they're venture capitalists a lot of them, you know, and and that's okay, you know I'm not critiquing them, but. Uh, Jason Calacanis, actually, who's a who's one of my investors, said to me, I didn't understand what he said, but he then I did. He he said, if you're too punk rock, you're crazy. You know, he can't be too too punk rock. Mm -hmm. We were talking about my wardrobe, actually, which was they needed a little tightening up. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to hear that at all. <laughs> he was right, though. You don't you don't think it earns you points for being eccentric and and charting your own path? a little like you know yes but there's a little like so for me my hair is always messy i can't do anything about it i, I have it keratins to the ends of the world and you know it doesn't matter if i've just done it or come from a salon it just is what it is and so i've been experimenting like you know how can i if that's going to be my punk rock thing what's happening with the rest here you know, so like I'm, I'm trying to put on some fancy earrings these days, as you can see, <laughs> you know, because I'm wearing a sweatshirt and my, I went to the gym earlier. Um, so I'm sorry, Jim, that's what I'm in. I'm in my workout outfit. <laughs> I would expect nothing less, Kate. So, <laughs> But that's the thing is like, um, it's the shabby chic. You just got to, you know, I, I uh, just again, segue. So I remember being asked to go to Chase Chase Manhattan Bank's um, flagship location in New York City to be on stage um, with a number of other people for some kind of accelerator thing or panel thing, I don't know, in startup life. And I go there in the morning and I remember right away thinking, I have made a grave error because everyone, everyone is in a suit and they look fabulous <laughs> with great jewelry and lipstick on and heels and I'm in jeans and a t-shirt and cowboy boots. And I blushed, I blushed in mortification, but actually this was the, this was a really weird experience for me. It was the first time this had happened. After I got off stage, three women came up to me in the bathroom or in the hallway and said these words, um, the words were, I want to be you. Which is like, powerful it's a compliment and also very strange to hear that you know because you are the the outlier like they want to be an outlier they they want to uh chart their own path but they don't have the courage which is part of what makes you you right is you courage or i'm a dumbass sometimes i mean i have to tell you like <laughs> well the, the, they're probably one They're and the same, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. We have, um, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but no. you made me think of something. So we have a family joke, my husband and I, and the the joke is moped. And it's because um, one time we, we drove to Vermont where my, my dad and my stepmom live and my sister was there with her family. And as we came in the driveway, they were all out in the field flying kites with um, fishing poles. <laughs> Pellet kite fishing, it's a ridiculous thing that we do. And I was so excited and wanted to get out of the car. We've been in the car for so long. So that the moment we pulled into the driveway, I went inside and I grabbed my beer and I there was a moped there and I got on the moped and put my beer in like the basket. And David is barely getting out of the car, my husband, because he's also a slow thinker. <laughs> And he's like, hey, do you know how to ride that thing? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I got it. And he's like, Kate, are you sure? <laughs> are, you, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I got it. And I literally rode straight into a tree. <laughs> <laughs> so the code word moped evokes all sorts of memories and warnings. Yeah, like, you know, is it courage <laughs> or something else? <laughs> And that's the thing about late, it's the same, right? So like, there's no, even when COVID happened, 
there were so many other really shitty things happening at lately at that time that I literally just took COVID and I put it over here and pressed on and it didn't affect what we were doing. You know, I mean, it ended up being good for us, but there was no, there's no, the, the blinders, I'm going to call them blinders. It's my negative view of it. You're going to say something nice and positive. I'm sure <laughs> should hang out. With you <laughs> really I won't, I won't turn it around. I'll, I'll, I'll look, look, I want you to see the sticky note. It says positive because I have a problem. I, <laughs> I, I don't think positive. Um, anyway, so that, that ability though, to not imagine any other, you know, I always say to myself, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing that could happen? You know, like with money or something. Okay. Worst case scenario, we have to sell the house and I have to live with my parents. That's the worst. That's the worst. It's pretty good. Right. Right. A lot of people would kill for that. Yeah. For that yeah. option. You know, because I can't imagine it to be, I mean, now I'm an upper middle class white chick. Not, I was lower middle class, but times have changed. <laughs> so <laughs> that probably sounds like silver spoony. Um, but yeah, the, the uh, inability, I think it's an inability to imagine Like, it's so funny that I'm talking to you and I'm hearing myself contradict myself because like, I can't imagine any situation except for lately working, but at the same time, I'm the, my worst critic. I'm always, I'm always just be, feeling crushed by um, the, or, or by the negative stuff, right? Like, so that's mm -hmm. the stuff that I, can't let go of you know i was just talking to brian my cto right before this call and we were looking at our numbers which so 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 in startup life guys and gals you're constantly making projections okay now mm -hmm. in the beginning it's all bullshit because nothing is real nothing has happened you probably haven't sold anything and you have no idea but yet people ask you for these ridiculous premonitions <laughs> they're trying to understand if you understand like the nuts and bolts of how things works what they're trying to understand so you, you make a lot of projections over the years now in the last two years and really the last year number one i learned how to manipulate and understand the numbers for myself which was extremely i'm a fiction writing person like other brain you know so this was a hard thing for me to do but it came out of necessity and was incredibly empowering. So number one, I understand the numbers in a way that I never understood before. Um, but also I have enough data so I can actually extrapolate real things now. Not, right. not, I'm not guessing anymore, right? And so as we're looking through these numbers, because I'm so used to giving people these answers in the future and it feels like bullshit, that it, they're right in front of me. And I'm like, oh, but you know, that's bullshit. And, and Brian's like, no, dude, this is real. <laughs> right, right. It's like you, you make that jump from uh, building a future where you're making guesses like, wait, this future is actually coming to fruition. And some of that BS is actually pretty accurate. Yeah, you cross over. You cross over. Um, it's amazing. I gotta say, Kate, I'm absolutely beside myself because the the lawn guy next door has been like circling my house. It's not even my lawn guy, but I swear to God, he's like torturing me throughout the last 45 minutes. I'm trying to mute. I'm trying to mute when the fucking blower comes near the window, and I'm like, "Can you hear that?" No, uh, no, I don't. Okay. I've never had a frequency that the lawn mow frequency because everyone says. It, feel so loud to them but it doesn't bleed through the mics okay. i don't know why so All right. so what I, is it i'm sitting here trying to mute and unmute and is <laughs> uh, is necessary so uh, somebody who knows radio would appreciate that um i do <laughs> well look well let me let me ask you this the of the things that you've accomplished 
and of the, the struggles that you have navigated, if not conquered. Um, as you look back on those times, are there figures or a figure that is particularly um, present that was by your side when you made some of those correct turns or, or navigated some of those difficult, insurmountable situations? Is there anyone that comes to mind that, that feels like that, uh, that most influential person for you? Yeah. I don't know if I mentioned her to you before, but I might have. So my Aunt Johnette is um, an, a remarkable human being. She, uh, this is going to get sad, so warning listener. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Johnette lost her three children in a fire. Um, is it 30 years ago? I'm 44, I think 30 years ago. Yeah, um, they were my cousins, of course, my first cousins, three of them, two boys and a girl. The girl was the middle child. We were the same age. So I was nine when they died. So she was, uh, she just turned 10, I think. She was like half a year older than me. And the boys were, um, I think DJ was 12 and John John was eight. And um, so, you know, Johnette heard about the fire on the radio. She was driving home from a, a trip, it was very early in the morning. And we, there, there was a babysitter that whose body was found. And we, we all didn't know, we thought it was my aunt. So for a long time, and my grandparents lived next door. Um, they had lost my, my, so my aunt, Johnette, her sister, Mary, and my mom, those are the three daughters. And they had a, a brother too, who died of cancer when he was young. So my, my grandparents lived next door and they were supposed to babysit the children that night but they got invited to do something else and so the kids would have been at their house the house caught on fire um it was a long overdue chimney leak i don't know the technical ideas here but um it uh, one of the wood stove basically exploded and the children died of um smoke inhalation they found my my cousin um, Johnette, Johnette Jr., sissy. Um, she had her own bathroom. They found her. She's not, she's 10. She, they found her in the bathroom with um, a towel, towels, trying to hold the towels up against the door. And they found her brothers walking down the hall towards her room. And there were um, fire signs, stickers on all the windows, and the firemen never put a ladder to any of the windows. And there were the reason that it exploded is they didn't know that that, that um, chimney was there. They had been sheetrocked up for years. It's a really old house. But yet a chimney sweep had been there recently and was on the roof and saw all the chimneys, but didn't tell the family that there were other chimneys. Um, so anyway, so my, my aunt lost her whole life. I mean, not only her children, but her house, all of her clothes, everything was gone, right? What do you do? And my, we had a, strange relatives in Chicago who swooped in and, and carted her off to Chicago, gave her a place to live and a job and some purpose. She then put herself through undergrad, uh, grad and masters, and she went to Washington, D.C. to help the poor. So she became the principal at the National Disability Institute in, in Washington, D.C. And she's the one that had said to me, so she's always been, and let me say this, she's always been my, my friend and mentor. Um, my mom left our town when I was young and my aunt held all the holiday things. So Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we were really close. And um, she was working with Walmart and had said to me, hey, you're really good at marketing want to consult us on this project. And she gave me that seat, which is what led to lately it in directly, right? Directly. Because just for people who don't know, I created Walmart, a spreadsheet system that right. got the us. Walmart spreadsheet story is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I love that one too. But she's the one that introduced you or introduced you to the folks at Walmart. Yeah. And she, yeah. what she did, Jim, was rem was remarkable because I've tried to emulate it and I'm not, I'm not very good. I aspire. She let me fall up. She let me fail. She knew that whatever I did would be still great. That was her belief. And boy, did I make some mistakes. I really did. And it didn't matter, right? Her, she had an unwill, unwavering faith in my ability to not, it wasn't do the job because there wasn't a job that was written out to be done. We were making it, we were all making history. We're making, uh, we, were, we were doing crazy stuff for, I mean, I know it sounds bizarre, but Walmart and the IRS and disability, you know, what a mouthful, but um, it was exciting. And she was doing it. She was pioneering this this project, um, and I was along for the ride. But but she believed, and I, I was bringing in ideas that were rock and roll because that's where I came from: mm -hmm. line cook, rock and roll, climber, right? And these guys are all corporate, and I got my ways, and you know it's not polished. Let's just say that. Right. And she didn't flinch, not once. And that's the thing. I try, I, only one other woman has done that for me in my life, another, another person who hired me. But when I got to Johnette, I recognized what it was and how valuable it was. And I've said that to my team before as well. Like, you know, when someone keeps asking me to, to check them before they finish do something, I get annoyed because I'm like, <laughs> first of all, I don't have time for this. But second of all, like I hired you, like, so the, the biggest fuck up you can make is not gonna be that bad. It just just go. go, just go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That is, <clears throat> that is quite a mentor. What a, what a horrific story. I'm so s sorry for that. What a woman, what a woman. But right to recover from that and to, so she went on. So how old was this when she lost her family? So it was 82 or 83. So it was 30 years ago this mar March, mar this March 8th, March 8th. So, and she, let's see, my mom is turning 75 on Friday. I think Johnette is like 72. So she was in her forties. Yeah. And she just changed her life. She changed her life. I mean, the fact that she didn't kill over and die was an incredible, yeah. right? And I don't, you know, at the time, and certainly for most of my life, I didn't recognize how great this pain had been because I don't have children and I was young, you know. I mean, at first I remember thinking, I mean, she was always, she was my favorite and I, and she didn't really want to hang out with us because we were reminded of her children. And I remember not understanding that, you know, it, when I was, you know, 10, 11. And then, um, over the years, it was just so nice to, you know, to work together. And, and I remember telling her, Jim, I used to have panic attacks about public speaking, believe it or not, um, because I don't, I don't, it's different being behind the mic and you can't see me and then I'm on stage, you know, and right. And um, back then I thought that when I was in front of people at, at any kind, whether it's a business meeting or presenting on stage, I had to be a certain kind of character you know, in uh, a straight skirt and, and heels and a jacket and things that are not me at all, actually. Mm -hmm. And so it was always really uncomfortable. And I, I remember having just the worst panic attacks about it and, tell, and telling her literally after, the, after this one I did in Salt Lake, I said, I'm, I'm never public speaking again, I'm done. <laughs> she reminds me of that often. <laughs> and so what did she say? Um, she's just like, no, look at you now. Right. Because mm -hmm. what I, what I learned to do was to embrace my own, um, punk rockness, you know, and to, instead of be ashamed of it or embarrassed of it, like that feeling I had when I walked into Chase Manhattan Bank and I was, or JP Morgan, whatever it was, was, um, to me, they're both the same thing, <laughs> stiff and rich. Um, <laughs> instead of you know feel as though i'd made a great mistake which maybe i had but then i found if you just say it out loud too if you if you acknowledge that 
the elephant in the room, everyone is relieved. <laughs> it takes all the it takes all the mystique and the power away from it because now everyone says, yeah. Oh yeah, this thing is this thing is actually happening. You don't have to make believe we don't have to make believe it's not. Yeah, totally. You know, like I'm the first one to to say is there shit in my teeth? <laughs> <laughs> this is your biggest fear. Once you can get rid of that, you can move on. Yeah. Yeah, you can. I mean, because again, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Because in my she had the worst, right? That's the worst. Right. And so right. It's never, it's never that, you know, that's why I always, I always think about that. And the other thing about Johnette that I remember, I don't know if she'll remember this, but I remember talking about radio and thinking like, oh God, what am I doing? Just this meaningless job, this meaningless career compared to what you're doing, Johnette, you know, you're saving the world. Literally like her, her job was to, um, get financial empowerment and education to the, to the poor, to people with disabilities, you know, 54 million Americans and help lift them out of poverty through this, these programs she was doing. And I thought like, you know, you're doing the real work. And she was like, no, you're doing real work too. You, you touch somebody's life every day. Mm -hmm. You know, think of the grace that woman has to think and say that, you know, and we all used to, she's easy to talk to. So we'd all go to her with all of our problems and cry and complain and whatever. And she would always just counsel you. And what she didn't do was roll her eyes, which I would have done. Be like, oh, your fucking problems. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Look at my life, right? You know? That's right. It's amazing. But that is that's amazing. perspective, right? That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That it's, it's great. The grace for someone to say, your situation is unique and I can appreciate that. And, and I think that's, that's part of it. Like what your aunt is saying is like, she's doing what's right for her and you are still, you can still and are impacting lives and helping people by using your gifts in the way that you're meant to be, they're meant to be used. Um, yeah. That's the trick of life, right? Is um, someone had asked on social, you know, why, why the um, aim to be perfect? You know, why is this things? Why is this a human sort of struggle? Is to always be perfect? You know, perfection is overrated. Was was essentially the comment, and I said, it's not about being perfect. It's about trying. Right, like, because all that means is you have something to look up to, a, a way to go, a direction, a, a a will to be better, whatever kind of better that is, you know, of your own skill set, or um, like you know, the the cliche greeting card is like improve one percent every day, or whatever, you know, how that goes. But like, it is that simple. Like, you have to. She wanted to be better there was that desire still in her right so she was able to live and move on and redefine her life um and that's the thing you know i think about every day somebody asked me last summer are you happy and the answer was no and i haven't said that since i left xm a long time and i made and I knew it already, but because someone asked me and I said it out loud, it made it true, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it was the, the catalyst to, to make the change when I did, right? And it's such a simple question to ask yourself. I mean, the, the, so many people have been doing that with the great resignation. <laughs> right. Which is great. I mean, I feel like except for fucking Ukraine and, and not fucking Ukraine, but fucking Putin and Ukraine. Like, I feel like the world is a happier place because of COVID. So when you, when you asked yourself or when someone asked you that question and you answered no, what was, what was the outcome of that? Like, what did you change? They asked, so they, they were asking in general, but I can only think lately 
<laughs> and so the lately answer was, uh, the, the question was, what do I like to do? And I like to write. I like to write the marketing and I like to write what's in product. And I like to work on the product. Um, with with Jay, I said specifically with Jason Debacco, my other co-founder. We work really well together, and we make things. And our um, ability to um, actualize an idea is in seconds. We're so we're really attuned at like just getting it done, and so it's very rewarding because we achieve shit, mm -hmm. a lot of shit together. Um, and we finish. He's he's my designer. Um, so we and he's incredible so we finish each other's sentences a lot so it's it's a it's fun and, and it's funny we're nerds you know we we watch every episode of the office fifty thousand times you know so there's and we have and we have that thing i, I don't know what this there must be a word for this and i should look it up because i do talk about it a lot but we have that language that you that little small groups make up their own language you know mm -hmm. right like your family has words like oh we have the moped word <laughs> right um, <laughs> but you have them sometimes with people, sometimes with small groups. It's like a vernacular, uh, whatever. And so we have that. Um, and I, I shifted the company. So we st all stopped doing, we all stopped making something we didn't want to make. And we started making the thing we set out to make is the shortest answer. Um, and the difference was like night and day suddenly everyone was happy and the energy changed and people were working on weekends again and overtime and having fun and problem solving as opposed to just in the fucking slog and like we had to get out of the scrape mindset and get into the growth mindset um i spent part of this catalyst was um mark roberge who was the former cro that of hubspot that took them to ipo um, we spent 10 weeks with him coaching us it you know it was a confluence of events that all happened to come into my lap at the same time and i had the wisdom to say yes right um and that let us release which i think you've seen the self-service products mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um also double down on artificial intelligence and content creation and get out of not get out of the publishing business, but um, embrace what makes us different as opposed to try to bang our heads against the wall with something that everyone else was already doing, you know? Um, so it was life-changing and will it work? I don't know. <laughs> it feels right though. <laughs> it feels right, yeah. I yeah. mean, it feels right, although at this moment, so I'm, going uh to florida for a few days starting tomorrow and i need i need the break i'm 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 having um i gotta split here actually in a second jim but i'm having yeah. that kind of kind of life where i'm slamming into my evening at 100 miles an hour you know what i mean if you i know you know what that's like when you're I, just like you, you know you're getting to the end of the day <laughs> yeah when i get yeah. into the end of the day and i'm just like bam and so like how do i how do you then you know get into your relaxed time it's really hard to then makes that transition because I need some kind of transition right. before I go to bed. And so, you know, I'm leaning on alcohol more than I normally would, yep. which is not great. Mm -hmm. And, or I'm, you know, I'm impatient to have dinner. So like I'm kind of a bitch because <laughs> it's, you know, I'm just trying to get into that place where I turn the phone off and I'm on the couch and I'm just checking out someone else's sitcom or, or whatever thing I'm binging and getting my um just getting my zone you know zoning out just, just right just the, right so. yeah making that transition that is i was there myself during during yeah, the right. pandemic and there were some intense periods of time working really hard and to shut it down yeah. um it was I mean, it was glasses of wine at 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, wait, this doesn't make sense. Like, why, why do I need a glass of wine at 11 o'clock at night? That's ridiculous. And and you start to realize, like, all right, yeah, something's something's got to change. Something's got to change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least you know that, right? Like, some people don't don't even, can't even get there. Um, but you know, there's it's just this weird 
kind of give and take like sometimes this is the life i choose i mean i ch i'm choosing to continue to be the ceo of this startup <laughs> you yeah. um, know this is this is that time in your life when you feel like that's the right fit you know and we yeah have different windows of time and th this is your this is your time for this but it won't necessarily last forever and it might transition into something different it sounds like it's already transitioning into the next phase which is yeah part of the genius you know, evolving <laughs> one one last thing on the perspective idea that someone said to me recently i was meeting with a financial i'm meeting with financial advisors because we're trying to grow up and like write our wills and do all these other things you know and figure out well shit how much do we fuck it up <laughs> is there still time to save save money and have a retirement fund and so you know they they ask you to list your assets and all these other things and so we're and so we sent sent all this paperwork beforehand and we're having the meeting and we're talking and then at the end and i was there's she's like anything else and i was like oh oh yeah well there's lately and they're like oh well what's the valuation of the company and i was like 14 million and he's like well that's your biggest asset <laughs> Oh yeah, there's that other thing. There's that lately thing that I've been dedicated to for 10 years. Yeah, and it didn't occur to me that this is A, an asset, and yes, my biggest asset. Like there's a reason I, I'm devoting all this time to this and it's not it's not for nothing, right? Right. I, no matter what, like, like if I don't raise the next round or if we don't hit the next, monthly recurring revenue milestone or whatever it is like it's still worth 14 million dollars i did that yeah you did and and it's just the start right i think think of all the things you were going to do this is one this is one of them you know yeah <laughs> and how many people have built a 14 million dollar startup i don't know we i really need to hang out with you more you're really good for me <laughs> <laughs> well but i mean look i know i know you're short on time and and i'm so appreciative of the time you've spent with us but i i feel like it's just important i think it's really important for people to hear <clears throat> not only do you have lessons and um wisdom to share but you also have struggles and you also have challenges and and things that that you're still working on and to me that's the thing that people don't see they don't say like wait you can't be both like yeah you absolutely can be both you can you can be you can be an amazing leader and struggle with a number of a number of things um yeah. and those things coexist for everyone all the time it's so important to share those things because then it's attainable for other people right it makes it way more attainable because now a young uh, female entrepreneur that looks up to you and sees you as the role model that she's emulating but she doesn't see the things you struggle with and so when she struggles with those she's like oh well i'm doing it wrong because obviously kate doesn't kate didn't go through those it's like, no, no, that's part of it. I remember getting my heart broken really badly, like the first time and being inconsolable, just crying and crying and crying. And, and my dad, I thought at the time that this was so callous, but later I understood what he was saying. He, he said, you're not the only person to ever experience this, right? That's what he said. <clears throat> and what he was saying was like, you know, well, what he was saying is like, Jesus Christ, it's not that big of a deal because you're only 14 or however old it was. But um, what he was also saying, which, which is when you realize you're not the only one, um, then the, the, the weight is off you for, for mm -hmm. just dealing with it, <laughs> you know? It's a lot easier to get through it when you there's the strength in numbers or, or um, 
not the strength in numbers so much as like the <laughs> or the weakness in isolation yeah <laughs> right it's yeah. like the, the reverse of it is that the most dangerous yeah. thing is to think that your challenge is unique to you which means you're flawed and there's something wrong with you because no one else has this problem right yeah like no no many many people have this problem and you are not unfortunately you're not as unique as you think you are yeah that's the biggest one <laughs> like you don't you know when you're a teenager of course the world revolves around you but um yeah it's it's a good i think about that too whenever and it's what it also means is like help exists because you know it's like when you type in anything in google it the thing you're someone has searched for it already that's why it's auto populating right. what you're thinking about right now there's some weird shit out there <laughs> <laughs> But there's like, oh, I'm not the first person to, that this is occurring to. Yeah. Um, anyways, I got to split. I got to I got to pack my bathing suits and my um, my mom. It's her 75th birthday and I'm, I'm bringing the party. It's all right here, literally. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to figure out how it fits into the suitcase um, and whether it goes under or over or these high class problem problems I have today. <laughs> Well, no, you please go, go prepare for your for your Florida trip and um, and thank you for thank you for sharing a, a tremendously difficult story about your event and um, and for sharing both your successes and and the struggles of someone who many people look up to as what they uh, what they hope to be, the epitome of uh, of success, and um, but you hit on the most important thing, which is happiness. You know, the, the success of reaching your happiness, and um, I think we're all we're all trying to get there. But thank you for sharing your path of how you're working on it. That it's a work in progress. Thank you, Dan Boy. I love you. Um... And your the way you describe me, um, it's not imposter syndrome because I'm not, you know, I'm not coy enough to pretend that I have that. But um, you make me want to do a better job of being the woman that I am. So thanks. That's all you have to do. You are enough. Kate, thank you very much for your time today. You're a treasure. I, I look forward to following you and uh, talking to you again soon. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>